Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to have a, some great, fantastic session on GDPR, security and compliance reporting, and also evidence collection best practices. So uh, today's session is going to be around GDPR best practices for AWS Cloud. Uh, it is also applicable to other clouds as well. So uh, stay tuned for some more details on that in the slides. Uh, so um, I'd like to kick this off uh, right away as we have uh, people pretty much all get together. Okay, my name is uh, Kamran Mehboob. I'm the Director of Product Marketing for Security and Compliance. Uh, and I have over uh, five years of experience in risk management, GRC, uh, and AWS uh, certifications as well. So quite a bit of knowledge there. And uh, the slides that you see here were prepared by me and also other folks as well on our team. So let's just kick this off real quick. So what are we gonna learn today? We're gonna learn just a real quick overview of GDPR. Uh, we're not gonna get into the real deep basics as we want to cover the advanced topics in the limited time that we have and focus on those articles and how those articles are applicable uh, to the AWS environment and how we can perform audits and keep our data secure and be compliant. So we're gonna go real quick around uh, evidence collection, best practices. This is actually one of the key components. Uh, and uh, we are going to cover how to find your PII data in your AWS databases. Uh, we're going to cover architecture principles in AWS. We're going to cover specifically which set of services that you need to watch out for. And we are gonna cover these articles, Article 5, 32, 25, and so on. Uh, not a whole lot in detail, but I'll pick a few that'll go into detail. But really, we're gonna get down to the AWS best practices for the technical controls. And I think most of you are uh, probably saying to yourself, well, I already know the GDPR. I just need to know how to execute it, uh, specifically on AWS, and how to get that process going quickly. So we're definitely gonna cover all those topics in this presentation. Uh, some parts of it can get technical, uh, so just bear with it. Uh, the entire session is being recorded, so it'll be available to you, uh, since I may go over some slides very quickly, uh, but you can certainly get back to it. And uh, feel free to ask questions, uh, or uh, you can certainly send questions afterwards at info at cloudnosis.com. Uh, it's a pretty active inbox that we monitor all the time. And of course, we're gonna cover uh, just an infomercial of about three minutes on Cloud Gnosis Security and Compliance Platform. Again, the goal today is to keep it very strong from a thought leadership perspective and show you all the technicals uh, and not really talk about our platform because I think that's, that's, a, that's kind of well understood over time. <clears throat> okay, so a quick overview of the law. So as most of you know, the law is passed and it's inactive. Uh, since May 25th, 2018. Uh, and now uh, everybody has most of the pieces implemented. If you don't, uh, that's okay because, uh, uh, you know, the auditor is going to be a, a little bit relaxed uh, initially, uh, but they want to see that you're progressing towards uh, complete compliance and you understand what compliance and specific uh, articles are all about. So, uh, a few things here, uh, you know, you have to uh, notify within 72 hours of any breach. Uh, the data scope piece we're going to get into, it's beyond just date of birth and national identity cards and biometric data and things like that. Uh, so, uh, and again, I'm not going to go into the detail of all these 10 points, but you can go over it at your leisure. Okay, so one of the big things that they talk about is personal data of a natural person. Uh, so we need to understand uh, what is this uh, personal data means, right? And Article 4 gets into that in detail. And it basically says that uh, you can identify a person either directly or indirectly. Now, uh, what it's really getting into identify are these identifiers, such as name, uh, identification numbers, location data, uh, and online, ad online identifier such as IP addresses and cookies and things like that, and more specific to physical, physiological, physiological, genetic, mental, economic, culture, social identity of that natural person. So 
Uh, it's it's pretty involved, as you can see, just by saying those things. And we're going to get into the actual, actual data element in the next slide. And, and Recital 30 uh, talks about online identifiers. Uh, so all these IP addresses, you know, cookies, uh, radio frequencies, RFID tags, uh, anything that you can use it to triangulate and find that person also becomes confidential data and you need to protect it and you need to inform um, how this data is being used as one of the articles called for. Now one of the biggest articles that's related to uh, technical measures and security is Article 25 which says data privacy by design and by default um, and really uh, this is really calling for that you need to put a, a complete um, uh, you know, uh, you know, basically complete principles around encryptions, uh, around uh, privacy enhancement technologies, and it also talks about you need to implement appropriate technical and organization measures as well. So, what does it mean? Is that first of all, by default, you have to do it. Um, a, a person has to come up to you and say, "Hey, please make sure my data is secure." You have to do it uh, by default, <laughs> and you must implement all these uh, encryption capabilities and uh, track metadata, uh, track you know, all the access to your public cloud. Uh, and then you know, we're gonna get into the actual data tracking piece of it, which is the technical. Okay, uh, so Article 5 uh, has to do with six principles data uh, accountability. So you got to process it lawfully, and you have to have legitimate purpose, uh, and you can only collect what is necessary, and you have to keep it accurate, up to date, uh, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the principles that you need to follow when you are collecting and processing data. Article 32 is about security of processing. And in short, uh, basically it says that the controller and processor shall implement appropriate technical organization measure and ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk. Now the word risk is used. Uh, if you look deeper into Article 35, uh, it talks about implementing a risk assessment process. So you need to implement some form of a risk assessment process in place and be able to identify where, it, where are the highest risks uh, you know, within your flow. Article 28 is about third party compliance. This I also want to touch as well because we have recent breaches going through a third party process where it's not you, but the person that you allowed uh, some other third party company to go into your cloud network and uh, the hacker came through their network and jumped to your network. So a couple of things you need to do here. Uh, first of all, standard co uh, contractual clauses need to be in place uh, and you need to review the GDPR BAA uh, from AWS. And you need to review uh, these controls and scans for the third party every month, every quarter, and based on the volume that you, the business that you're doing with the third parties. Uh, so the first thing that kicks off is inventory and PII data. And there's many ways of doing that. Probably the simplest and the cheapest way is to use the AWS Macy service. Uh, and this service actually scan all of your databases, actually just S3 databases right now. Uh, and they are adding other databases, RDS, EBS, stuff like that. Uh, but at least you can go through scan and it'll find you know, all the obvious things like <clears throat> for uh, first name, home address, email, uh, telephone number, uh, national identity, uh, you know, any and social security numbers and travel license numbers, things like that. Uh, so all of those are, are private data that you need to uh, keep track of and have it encrypted and so on and so forth. And for the other databases that you have, uh, you can use third-party products like Data Guys, Data Sunrise, and Perva is also a very good solution. And there are some open source tools as well uh, that'll scan your database on GitHub. So the next thing is, okay, um, now that you've got your privacy data, okay, great. You know, uh, now you need to talk about how we can uh, ensure privacy on that in terms of encryption, in terms of version control, in terms of data integrity, in terms of Making sure that uh, you know that they are uh, uh, definitely at a level uh, in terms of uh, 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 cipher levels and things like that. 
So in short, evidence collection okay, really means that uh, it's, 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 it's a function, it's a, it's a couple of things associated with that. So first of all, it's protection, okay, the protection that you're doing uh, in terms of encryption and so on. Then you have to perform a risk assessment. That's part of the evidence collection process. Uh, and then compliance and KPI reporting. Okay, so all the measures that are associated with compliance controls uh, that you need to uh, keep track of. And of course, audit management. So all of those activities are part of your evidence collection process and they need to be presented. So for example, is, is S3 bucket versioning turned on? Okay, and S3 is a, uh, is a file store in AWS and you need to ensure that is the encryption turned on? Is the, uh, is the global settings uh, is to off, like it's not available open to public? Uh, is the elastic load balancer and cipher levels are at TLS you know, at least 1.2 or higher? Are the lock collection enabled for the VPC subnets? So all of these are rules or controls, are these audit controls that you need to check every hour on the hour because cloud is changing uh, by the minute. Uh, and then you need to collect that data and, and then be able to report on it and be able to present that as evidence. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show that in more detail uh, in the following slides. But first thing I wanna cover is that most people don't understand that, uh, that the cloud is all about uh, configurations, you know, hundreds of configurations, actually thousands. Uh, and Gardner is saying that 95% of all cloud breaches will be due to customer's fault. Now that word customer's fault that the cloud vendors are providing lots of controls. The question is, how effectively are you managing those controls? And how are you automating the management of those controls? And that's going to determine your compliance posture, your security posture. So something to keep in mind. Okay, uh, one area is the AWS shared security model. I know it's pretty basic, um, but I'm amazed that lots of people don't know about this. So please spend some time. This is an, this is an AWS slide. So AWS is saying we're responsible for the hardware and the infrastructure and so on. You're responsible for your data and, and applications and all the configurations associated with that at the top, uh, everything from firewalls and network to encryption. Uh, and to data access, you're responsible for that, you the customer. So that's important to know. Um, in terms of architecture, now people ask, okay, is there a specific architecture for uh, GDPR? Uh, <clears throat> there is no like hard and fast rule, but there are some standards set by, by the cloud vendors. So for example, AWS has what is called a NIST, uh, AWS three-tier reference architecture. Uh, and this reference architecture has everything you need to uh, place the right components in the right availability zone, uh, have the right Bayesian access uh, to be able to uh, access your network resources and be able to have that security that you need. Now there's a lot of configuration associated with everything from IAM to VPCs to S3s, security groups, auto scaling groups, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, Again, it's a, it's a very technical area and uh, compliance folks tend to get scared of it, but it's not too bad if you just spend your time uh, with some training, with some certification, especially the, uh, the very first one, the cloud practitioner, the certification you should get uh, from AWS to be able to understand all the components, be able to understand the design principles and architecture principles. Uh, those are all important. So again, this is available on AWS uh, you can uh, go through that at, at your leisure. Okay, so uh, the NIST compliance workbooks and templates. So the question is, well, are there are there guidance available, and how can I set up this three-tier architecture very quickly? So uh, the link below says free download. Uh, you can actually download this cloud formation template. Uh, this is a template that if you were to execute with an AWS, it will set up your three-tier architecture and all the right components and configurations in place. Uh, and you can start from there. That is your starting point. It is not the end point, it's your starting point. And also you should look at the uh, uh, NIST cybersecurity framework, NIST controls, 
uh, and there is a uh, there is a Excel sheet uh, with that link there, uh, and you can go through that. So there's about 1,700 rows of controls. Uh, 272 are applicable to uh, your AWS cloud services. So definitely take a look at that because that has some sort of value. And in setting up the right infrastructure with the right controls, uh, that is uh, that is that is aligned to NIST and it's also aligned to GDPR uh, as well. Okay, so let's get into a little bit about uh, speed of evidence collection for compliance. So you have you have two methods. You have the old traditional method, uh, and let's take an example for PCI. Okay, so this is again similar to GDPR. So if you had if you if your traditional process, you know, uh, assessor will come in, and it will request for 300 pieces of evidence, and assessor will come on site, uh, and it'll shoulder surface you by looking at uh, because you'll be showing him all the evidence process of the data. Uh, and it'll be kind of going over things and taking screenshots and reviewing your scan results and things like that, right? Uh, so, I mean, it's going to be a week on site, and it's going to be three or more weeks with email requests and phone calls and things like that. It can get uh, much longer than that, depending on how, uh, how, you know, how mature are your processes in place. So, this is your typical process. Now, in a cloud-enabled world on your right-hand side, where everything is automated, now, automation is the key in the cloud because you really can't survive without automation. So you can generate the audit data in real time throughout the year. You can give auditor the access, static access uh, uh, to these examples. Um, and auditor, basically, you know, when the auditor is ready to do the audit, it, it'll, it'll, you just point to the folder uh, or the portal with all the data uh, in it, and um, it's not going to take more than a day on site for him. So literally time lapse is about a day on site and few observation interviews, and you're pretty much done. So there's enormous amount of time savings, enormous amount of cost savings uh, in automating everything uh, and keeping it organized. So we're going to talk about that automation next and how you can uh, achieve that. So here's the flow of evidence collection and um, how you can organize uh, your evidence collection process. So remember I talked about a couple of activities that you know you have to have uh, uh, a logging turned on and you have to have your infrastructure uh, based on and organize um, uh, a framework like NIST and so on. Okay, So this kind of goes through in, in some form of, of detail. Now, certain things are easy to do for evidence collection perspective and other things are hard to do. Now, this evidence collection also has to do with generating reports. So it says evidence collection, but just think of it data collection so that I can generate an audit report of pass and fail risk rating. So these are the inputs that you need to make that report, and that's what the auditors are looking for from you, okay? So these auditors are gonna look for all of that. So let's go through the very first one. Uh, the very top one on your right-hand side, it says AWS Infra Logs and Config. Okay, so these are easy to turn on. You can just go in and turn on the switch. Uh, the Config is a is a is a tool, is a is a function with AWS. You can turn on same as CloudTrail, CloudWatch, and VPC Flow Logs. That's easy to do. Easy. You can just turn it on. Okay. Uh, also, uh, the second one, uh, Service Log, S3 Logs, RDS Logs, and Lambda and things like that. That's also fairly easy to do. You can just go and turn that on. Uh, and same thing with host-based logs. So your applications are running um, and uh, there's there's logs about access and audits and things like that. That's uh, re reasonably easy to do, but you have to set up the path and things like that. So there's still a little bit more programming work involved, uh, but it's still fairly easy to do. Okay. Those are the easy, the easy things that you can do. Now, now, now here's the thing. So let's let's give an example. You turn the log on, right? How do you know someone didn't turn it off later on? Okay. Now the way you check all that and a lot more details is is at the very bottom piece where it says machine metadata and related configuration changes and limits reached, etc. Now all these things, okay, you can go through your AWS menus. Uh, and they are very nested menus. They are very uh, drilled down, and they're extremely technical. Okay, 
and and to do this manually it just can't be done it's literally impossible because you have so many services uh, there's no way you're going to go through 100 menus and sub menus uh, every day every week it's just not humanly possible okay and collect all that data in excel spreadsheet and try to figure out what changed what didn't change and what's compliant what's not compliant that, that's just not going to scale it just does not work so you have to write your own scripts to be able to do that okay so let's say you did that you got all that data together okay all in one place now the next thing comes in is evidence collection evidence analysis so you got all your data and now you have to do evidence analysis okay <clears throat> this is a very technical area where you need expertise from security you need expertise from compliance you need expertise from risk need expertise from audit functions and all of that have to work together to come up with the right set of uh, compliance reports or security reports that would say pass or fail based on your corporate policies based on GDPR and PCI and HIPAA and so on and then also have risk ratings associated with it and be able to generate a report so that's really what it's all about at the end of the day um, and if you were to say to yourself okay um, I'm willing to do that then let's let's have you walk through what you need to do. So let's let's give I'm gonna give two examples here, one for VPC and one for S3. So this is the VPC slide that you're looking at. Uh, so how should we audit the virtual private cloud function within AWS? Okay. You can ask the same question about Azure, you can ask the same question about Google. It's the same question. Now you have to look through to say, okay, in VPC uh, I can do the easy things, which we talked about, like turn on VPC flow logs, CloudTrail, CloudWatch, config. And there's something called Trusted Advisor within, within AWS that tells you, it has about 17 rules that tells you about uh, security practices, you know, uh, the, the best ones uh, that you should have them on and so on. You should, you should have your Trusted Advisor turned on. Okay, so uh, easy to turn on and collect requires, but it requires log correlation. And uh, it's a lot of data points. Uh, you have to go through log correlation. And there is information latency because the output comes a little bit delayed. Uh, and it, of course, requires automation, integration, and analysis. OK, this is the piece, which is what I'm telling you regarding what's easy to do. Now, what's hard to do and, and gives you a lot more data, and, but you can act on it very quickly. Uh, you can generate alerts if you write these API functions. Now, for custom rules, these are the custom rules on the right-hand side for the VPCs that you need to write. Uh, why you need to write these rules? So first of all, it's just an example of these rules, like unused VPC internet gateways, uh, ineffective network ACL deny rules, uh, unrestricted inbound traffic rules, outbound traffic rules, uh, enable flow logs for the subnets, uh, look at the VPC endpoints if they're exposed, uh, and looking at things like tunnel redundancy, state private gateways, and peering, cross-peering across accounts. All of these rules uh, are best practices. These are control points that you need to analyze for your VPC and then develop a security posture, a compliance posture, and report on it. Okay? And you need to run these uh, rules practically every hour on the hour uh, if your cloud is changing uh, quite a bit. So at least you should be running it, uh, I would say, once a day. And then basically have any uh, alerts generated to take action. So if someone, um, you know, uh, had, a, had an ineffective deny rule uh, enabled in access control list, that's something you can go and very quickly take action. So again, it's pretty complex and it requires expert understanding of AWS at a security level, at a component level. Uh, and of course, you need to understand these rules themselves and be able to apply these rules. Okay, so that's one example in VPC. The second example is on S3. Same thing. So you have to go look at the S3 bucket, which most of us uh, put our log files and, and, and data files and uh, and those sort of things in that uh, file store, which is extremely popular service, by the way, uh, for AWS. Now, same thing. You're going to ask the question, okay, uh, is the S3 bucket open to the world? Uh, uh, or, you know, what kind of read access it has? Or is the, is the encryption enabled? Is the multi-factor authentication enabled? Uh, is the lifecycle policies are enabled? 
Uh, and do you have a secure transport to S3? Is the server-side encryption is turned on? Uh, so all of these things, all of these rules, uh, you have to actually write the APIs for and run those analysis and get the data back and be able to generate those reports. So as you can see, it gets complicated very quickly. Now I just talked about two services. In a, in a typical three-tier architecture, you're probably gonna use approximately, I would say 20 to 25 of these services, if not more. So as you can see, this whole data collection, analysis, risk management becomes complicated very quickly. Um, but that's just part of managing the cloud. Uh, they give you to at Amazon, just think about it, giving you a house with, with lots of windows and keys and doors and uh, you know roof access. And you as a customer need to make sure that every night everything is buttoned up and closed and uh, you know no one can get in. So that's that's just part of the responsibilities of the, the share responsibility model. Okay, so let's kind of get into all of that data collection. What is it that the auditors are looking for? And frankly, what is it that you are looking for? Well, what you're looking for is uh, you're going to read a line item um, in a regulation like GDPR. So we'll take like Article 25, okay? Uh, we'll take Article 25 and the auditor is, is gonna ask you, okay, for Article 25, do you pass or do you fail? Okay, if you pass, please show me all the access controls that you have in place and how do they rank and uh, show me some data points of how you kept uh, your data stores uh, private and show me all the audit logs uh, and show me uh, uh, the, you know, how, how you're controlling all that. So they're kind of looking for a spreadsheet like this, not exactly, but something like that where you can say, oh yeah, Article 25 actually failed because uh, we had over 100 controls or access controls and um, and uh, so 100 of them failed, the 29 passed, and so on and so forth. So you kind of have like red, green, blue area, uh, and you can walk them through each and every services under Article 25 and walk them through it because they're, yes, they're gonna be um, a little bit annoyed the fact that you have it fail, but they're more interested in knowing, okay, what failed and how do you process that? And are you in a process of remediation or not? And what's the timeline for remediation? So all of those things, you need to have it documented, you need to demonstrate, uh, and these are the kind of few key areas that you need to pay attention to. Okay, so uh, enough on that, so let's let's kind of get into those top 10 that you guys have been waiting for, but I speed this up a little bit. Uh, so missing link in AWS security, okay? And it's really all around automation. Now, you need to think automation every day. You need to write these automation scripts uh, and you need to grab all that data, store it, and analyze it. So it is not humanly possible for anyone to scan thousands of configurations that are changing on the hour on the hour. Uh, and and just having AWS config and logs turned on is not enough. Um, because you do need to process other information, which is the metadata that we, that we talked about. So uh, one area that you wanna kind of get into is Center for Internet Security Control, AWS Best Practices uh, Benchmarks. So this is published. So if you just do Google CIS AWS Benchmarks, uh, they will come up and these are 44 security controls. Uh, and you can kind of ask yourself that, look, you know, it's too hard for me to write these scripts. Uh, I, just, I just want the basics right now and make sure that I'm protected. So my recommendation would be to at least minimum Take a look at the CIS AWS benchmarks. Make sure they're implemented on your networks, on your data. Make sure that you're running these controls every hour on the hour, assuming your cloud is changing quite a bit. Uh, if not, at least running it once a week, once a day, to make sure that everything is buttoned up every day and nothing has been changed. So that's important, so kind of take a look at that. And this. This goes into kind of slew of things, and by the way, we're gonna cover top 10 of, of the CIS and overall best practices coming right up. Okay, um, so a quick summary is there are some legal responsibilities and obligations around G and GDPR, like uh, AWS BAA, uh, that you need to kind of go review and sign off. Um, you can also review the Privacy Shield Framework, which is a self-certified process. Organization responsibilities, you need to assign a data protector. 
and which will govern and benchmark the program and technical responsibility, which we talked about quite a bit, which is inventorying the data, putting the controls in place, building your collection expertise, uh, and paying attention to things like you know encryption, DLP, and uh, all of the controls that, that, that we talked about. Okay, so jumping into top 10 uh, quickly, uh, and again, these are kind of technical controls. Uh, you do need some AWS expertise around that, uh, but these are very applicable to other cloud vendors as well. So the first one is identity and access management. That is your gateway uh, and making sure that you don't have any root account access because uh, root gives access to everything. Uh, for administrative rights, uh, you need to create admin users and assign specific policies to that and also make sure uh, you'd be amazed that people don't have their billing and contact information uh, set appropriately, especially the security setting, uh, contact information within AWS. So if you do uh, have your keys compromised, you know, you can recover them very quickly. And one in three customers have root access keys enabled uh, based on our, on our research. Number two is review permission to use strong password. Uh, it's important to use uh, strong password policies uh, and, uh, you know, uh, basically review your IAM policies around that. You, know, you, should, you should take a look at how many people have unrestricted access. You should limit access. Uh, and you can also, by the way, use the IAM policy generator, the policy simulator for assistant uh, within the AWS environment. So you guys can take a look at that. Enable multi-factor authentication. That's an easy one. You can turn that on. Now remember, you can turn that on, but you also have to constantly check, is it still on? Because someone can actually go back in and turn it off for their convenience. Uh, so to track fraud effectively, you need to have multi-factor authentication turned on within, you know, within your IAM process. Okay, um, don't leave the front door open with security groups. Security groups is one of the areas that you can control everything. It's sort of your virtual firewall uh, by giving access to all the resources uh, and, uh, and you know, monitor, uh, monitor security groups regularly. You should also turn on the AWS WAF, Web Application Firewall, uh, which is a service that uh, is provided by AWS that can help you uh, basically uh, reduce considerably uh, your common web exploits like, you know, SQL injection and cross scripting and so on. Rule five, uh, build a secure AMI image. Uh, it's important to build your base image uh, with all the vulnerabilities checked and uh, you need to uh, disable the password only access to the host. You should be using SSH keys for that. Uh, and you should also disable remote access, you know, root access logins. Uh, so, you know, really ask that if, is, it, is it really needed? Uh, and of course, ensure only, uh, uh, only required application services are enabled on the uh, OS uh, and the stack uh, that you're putting together as part of your AMI, which is the Amazon machine image. Uh, and then number six is, is encryption. Now encryption can get complicated across the board in AWS. It's easy to turn on, but it's something that you need to manage uh, and you need to track to make sure that you know everything is in play. Um, TLS, uh, both you know, SSL 2.0, 3.0 have been deprecated. You, you guys should know that by now. You should not be using uh, SSL 3.0s. Uh, TLS 1.3, is the latest version of TLS, but at minimum you need to have 1.2 or higher. Don't don't use 1.1 because it has a lot of uh, vulnerabilities reported. So you need to move up to 1.2 or higher. Uh, use key management service to encrypt your data on AWS, and you can also uh, you should also enable automatic key rotation for your existing uh, customer master keys, which are CMKs, uh, in your uh, environment. Now, again, there are multiple checkpoints that you need to do encryption, everything from RDS to EBS to S3s uh, to load balancers, uh, so, you, know, uh, you know, Redshift. There's a lot of, a, a, quite a few uh, uh, encryption points that you need to look at and analyze to make sure that everything is, is in place 
and stays in place. So this is the problem with cloud that you think it's in place. Uh, absolutely is, but if you come back tomorrow, look at the console, someone probably went in and changed something or somebody started a service and did not encrypt the data. So you need to monitor for all of that. And again, only, only as I said, automation will make that happen for you. Okay, monitoring unauthorized access. Uh, this has to do with Cloud Rail, Cloud Trail, and Cloud Watch. Um, so it records the so Cloud Trail records all the API activities, and Watch uh, can send notifications based on configuration. Now, just because you have these two things turned on are not enough. Why? Because you need to create a metric filter. You need to assign a metric, and you need to assign. You need to create an alarm. And then you need, after you create the alarm, you need to uh, test the alarm by receiving a uh, SNS notification, uh, which is kind of like a alert or email service, you could say, of Amazon. Uh, and then be able to look up that event and take action. So there's multiple steps involved. It's not just turning on. So you have to write automation. Is the log turned on? Yes. OK, great. Log is turned on. Oh, is the uh, log metric, is, is, the, is the filter? And, and the metric is enabled for that. Yes, it is enabled for that. The third one is, is the SNS notification set appropriately? Yes, it is. Now, there's like three or four checks. It's not just turning on log. Uh, and all these different checks involve APIs. Okay, you have to write these scripts in your API to be able to check those things. So again, invest your time in a concept called security as code, compliance as code. Uh, it's not just standard operating procedures. It's actually writing code and running that code every hour in the hour that checks for compliance. Okay, number eight is use simple token service for vendors. Now, for those of you that are doing third-party risk management, pay attention to this one. Um, when you give access, your cloud access to a third party, okay, you should be giving it through, which is Amazon's best practice, it's called STS, uh, uh, simple token service. Uh, and uh, the value of it is that these are temporary credentials that last for a few minutes to give access and they get, uh, and they actually get turned off. And, and a new token is generated uh, every time access is requested. And this is all automated. You don't have to do anything. You just have to make sure that uh, you give them this uh, STS access and it's easy to do on your AWS account, uh, uh, console. And by the way, CloudMosis application, the SaaS application that connects to your AWS infrastructure using this uh, AWS security token service. And again, you know, we just basically connect uh, for a few minutes and then disconnect and then uh, the password is changed uh, by AWS. Okay, number nine is about securing your buckets. Now, most of the uh, hacks that you have, that have been reported data breaches that are taking place is through buckets being left uh, open. Um, although Amazon has done a good job in exposing that, uh, finally, uh, but also you as a practitioner should be looking at it very carefully. Uh, is this a bucket needs to be open? In some cases, it needs to be open if you have a static web page and things like that. Uh, but normally, uh, again, if it's PII data, it should never be open. Uh, and you can check them, you can run on the Macy service to make sure that you don't have any PII data in your buckets. So, um, so again, this is a pretty standard one, but it's amazing that how people miss this one. Number nine, uh, number nine should really should be number one, quite frankly, with all, with all the mishaps that we have in number nine. Number 10, conduct a vulnerability assessment. Uh, this is uh, not a control point, but this is something that's going to drive your control point and your best practices. Vulnerability assessment is pulling in all your data and assets and uh, doing analysis uh, on all the data, uh, all, all data collection uh, that we talked about, everything from network discovery to vulnerability scanning and, you know, looking at those results and analyzing them. It does require automation, does require third-party tools to be able to do these kinds of things. Uh, but this best practice needs to be implemented sooner than later uh, to show and demonstrate that you are GDPR compliant. Um, so with that, uh, just uh, what's, you know, what we have learned today is, uh, you know, top 10, 44, 150 control is not enough. Uh, even writing security operation policies and so on are not enough. 
what's what's the new thing that you need to do is is automation okay this is the new cloud norm and that's going to drive enforcement and accountability for your cloud so invest in automation uh, take time out for that because that's what you're going to need to make things happen and go forward so with that on the automation and reporting piece i'm going to talk about uh, cloud gnosis security platform for just two minutes and then we'll get into q a okay so um Cloud Gnosis is a security and compliance platform that automates all this data collection uh, and it automates your reporting. Uh, and it also provides a single portal capability uh, for uh, all the alerts, all the remediation, and of course, all the, uh, all the auditors that can come and take a look at that. And you can satisfy your uh, compliance process and even security process with that. And it'll alert on uh, vulnerabilities, it'll generate the reports, and it also has uh, remediation steps uh, for all the violations. And it also does a risk assessment process as well by rating uh, the uh, findings on, on a risk rating basis. Um, so what we have done is taken all the control points, all the compliance recommendations uh, from different bodies and consolidated and mapped that into specific security controls, like the VPC cloud that I was talking about, the S3 cloud that I, the S3 buckets that I was talking about, and be able to test those controls and generate those reports every hour on the hour. Uh, it looks something like this, where a scan is ran, we uh, 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 you know put the uh, you know put the risk by groups, give you an overall uh, uh, security score, uh, and show you uh, where these violations are, which region and some details around each specific uh, test that was failed, why it was failed, and how you can potentially fix it. Uh, some series of reports uh, that are audit ready that you can submit, you can submit it to the board, to your legal counsel, and so on. Uh, so they understand that you know uh, these tests were ran and those are the outputs of those uh, specific tests and whether you're compliant or not. Um, these these violations are also reported on a geo map, so you know where these violations exist and how you can quickly get them. Uh, just another view on compliance dashboard that we have. There's a security dashboard as well. So, you know, um, uh, really what you're trying to do is protect your data, protect your company. Compliance is just a byproduct, is a, is a, is a, is a byproduct and, um, and it's something to prove to the regulators but really what you're trying to do is secure the company. So we have security specific things within our capabilities. Um, and of course, and th th that's part of the security dashboard, security reports uh, that you will get as well. So it talks about the uh, attack surface, all the assets, and uh, uh, what is the vulnerability state of these assets. And also give you a health meter, a health chart that shows uh, progress uh, over time whether your compliance uh, posture is going up or down and on which projects and so on and so forth. And there's also uh, some cost elements that we display as well. This has to do with shutting down machines that should not be turned on because if they're developed machines at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., you can turn them off and bring them back up at 7 uh, to reduce your attack surface. It's all about reducing your attack surface at the end of the day. Uh, okay, so what we learned today is cloud security for GDPR is shared responsibility. Automation is key to maintain the best GDPR compliance posture. So think automation, think automation. Can't stress enough. Take a look at your CIS rules. They're applicable not only for you, but also for third party risk management process as well. Uh, DevOps uh, needs to be part of this entire flow. And you need to integrate through APIs all these automations that we're talking about in your uh, CI/CD flow, uh, measure progress through KPIs uh, via automation, and uh, you know learn those CIS rules that we talked about, those 44 AWS best practices, and uh, you know hopefully you guys can enforce that, uh, and also create a baseline uh, for your AWS uh, by benchmarking it. Now you can benchmark manually, which takes forever. Or you can use a platform like ours to actually go through a baseline and understand you know, where do you stand from a security and compliance uh, a risk and posture level standpoint. Okay, so this leads me to any questions that you may have.
and I'll open the chat box and you guys can ask questions at this point. So, uh, okay, so the first question that we have here around is, where, where do I find these controls that you talk about on, um, on different services? So, and, uh, and, I, and how do I write these, uh, uh, these set of rules? Well, first of all, <clears throat> so we talked about the AWS uh, CIS rules. Those are easy to find. Uh, you can just Google that, uh, AWS benchmark, and you should be able to get to that. And there's about 44 security controls. Now, those security controls, uh, believe it or not, none of those controls talk about encryption, okay, which is extremely important for the GDPR piece. Uh, and then those are the starting point of those 44 controls. Uh, so, the rest of the, so the rest of the controls, you need to read a lot of documentation on AWS Cloud, and you need to uh, uh, really uh, talk to multiple folks in your organization to be able to say, okay, we're going to create few rules for each of the services. So what those rules should be. Now, those rules, uh, you can certainly Google and try to find those rules, but a lot of it is gonna be around your knowledge because most of these rules are not written anywhere. Um, and, uh, and, and even if you find them, they're very hard to follow uh, why they wrote these rules. So uh, a lot of expertise are required in understanding these rules and writing these rules, uh, and that's why a lot of companies are uh, are are just relying on third-party vendors. You know, we're we're one of them uh, that we write these rules. You know, uh, and have and have them available on the platform. So, uh, but I still highly encourage that you should go through the exercise of writing few of your rules to understand what it to really understand that, you know, how you need to secure the cloud. Uh, cloud, like I said, you know, Amazon's giving you a house with keys and doors and, and, you know, locks and so on and so forth, alarm system and fence, but it's your job to monitor uh, that house and to keep track of that house, who's going in, who's coming out, who's throwing a rock and so on and so forth. So, again, I mean, thousands of, of configurations are involved. So only uh, automation can do that. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, how, do you, uh, uh, how do you compare to uh, uh, like these network analysis tools like, like Nuces? Uh, well, so, you know, there's a lot of, in fact, most of the tools out of the market right now, they're all around what is called inflow traffic analysis, meaning that they look at your network traffic and they follow that traffic into your applications. Uh, so those are still great tools to use to keep track of your log files, keep track of your, uh, uh, you know, network flow. But they work. They operate mainly at the data layer. Okay, they don't operate at the infrastructure layer, and they do not operate at the configuration layer of the infrastructure. So those tools are are not designed for that. They're ineffective. And uh, you will never be able to use those tools and to say that is the encryption level not only turned on, but the TLS version is 1.1 and higher. You're just not going to get that from any of those tools. Not even, uh, uh, you know, not even the uh, most famous CASB products. So, so look for the products that are that are purpose built specifically for the cloud, specifically for the cloud security and specifically for the configuration and infrastructure monitoring and tracking piece of it. Uh, so there aren't a whole lot of companies out there, uh, but they are starting to uh, build those capabilities. Uh, okay, there's a question on uh, licensing. Uh, well, licensing is pretty straightforward. Uh, we basically charge by a number of AWS accounts. So one account, you know, on average, we charge $100 per month uh, per AWS account, and you have access to uh, unlimited reports. You have access to unlimited data, uh, and and we store the data for a year, so you get all of that. And it is, of course, enterprise planning as well, where it gets lower price than that. So you can check with our sales folks around that. Okay, question around, uh, uh, you know, how do you 
how do you model the risk ratings on GDPR? So that's a good question. Uh, so basically, uh, on that, you know, first of all, it's not just GDPR. Let's take PCR, HIPAA. They all fall in the same category. The methodology that we follow is that, first of all, uh, we have done a crosswalk uh, through NIST and uh, as, as our as our baseline, and then we map. Uh, the controls, uh, all of that, uh, and then we look at each and every control. So let's take GDPR Article 25, which is very broad, extremely broad, actually. But we look at all the services that are associated with that, and we line up all these services. So let's say there are five services that you're using, and each of those services have 10 control points. So you have now 50, five, zero, 50 control points. And then we would analyze one control point, and then we say, did it pass? Did it fail? Okay, it's it's pretty much binary. So let's say if it passed, then your 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 uh, risk level is low, uh, and and we mark that as pass. Okay, but let's say if it fails, then when it fails, we either mark the security level medium or high, based on how severe. Uh, uh, that control point is okay. So, and then we sum up all these scores, and then we roll it back up to the top and give you a, an overall rating. So that's how we do it, uh, and uh, I'm sure other vendors are probably pretty similar. Uh, or you know, you can you can you can create your own risk management process uh, the way you want to score uh, and create a a, a scoring posture. So that's really entirely up to you. Uh, no regulation really tells you exactly what the what the risk model is. They just tell you that you should have a risk management process uh, based on, you know, good guiding principles. Hope I answered that one. Uh, we are running pretty uh, high on our time, so let's see. I'll take one or two more questions. Uh, okay, so on the uh, uh, there's a question around uh, CASB product. Uh, is that enough to satisfy GDPR? Well, my answer to that is uh, no, 100% no. Uh, because first of all, you need to understand cloud access security broker products, the CASB product, all operate at the data layer. Okay, so they look at your data. They look at uh, you know where the data is and who's accessing it and so on. Um, that's fine. That's a component of GDPR compliancy, uh, but it's not absolute because uh, CASB, as I said earlier, they do data layer. They don't do infrastructure layer. Uh, so you have to monitor the infrastructure layer. At the end of the day, uh, if the infrastructure says access is turned on uh, through the configuration, then that's what matters. Uh, so it's important to have another set of tools or your own um, uh, automation scripts that is going to check for all of that. Okay, so um, at this point, I want to thank everybody for joining today, and please look for our next uh, seminar. Uh, we are uh, going to talk about uh, DevOps and security around DevOps, how to secure that. Uh, so please register for the next one. Uh, do definitely uh, op open up a free trial to actually run your infrastructure uh, and analyze your infrastructure for GDPR compliancy and other compliance reports that we offer. Uh, you can get that 14-day, uh, no question ask uh, trial, and there's no limits on a trial. You can run thousands and thousands of uh, instances and so on through it and get your report. Uh, and uh, any questions you have, send it on info at cloudnoses.com. Thank you very much and enjoy your day.